So welcome back to, I guess, what we'll call the second main lecture in Module 1. Uh, so we're studying uh, Michael uh, O'Sullivan's book, um, The Leveling, uh, What's Next After Globalization. Uh, and this is uh, International Business uh, 3730, uh, Special Topics. I've given you an introduction to the book, and I've pointed you to some uh, review videos that I wanted to watch. And I've told you to buy the book and hope you read some of it. So, uh, so let's uh, continue now is take you through the book, uh, kind of chapter by chapter. But my goal here is not to supplement the book. I mean, you're going to read it and you're going to find out you uh, what you what you're going to take away. What, in a sense, I'm going to give you is some of what I think are some of the important highlights, uh, areas we can think about. Um, I guess in a sense what I thought was interesting, really, uh, I guess is what you're getting from me or the things that when I, I read the book, I said, I took my notes at the end of each chapter and I wrote them in a big notepad and then I went through my notes and read the book again. And, and this is these, uh, this is what I took away from my reading. I think after our discussions, I, I'll probably find, you know, oh yeah, yeah, there's some really a whole bunch of things in there that I've, uh, that I've left out. It's a, it's an interesting and a deep book. So I'm looking forward to you uh, as students in our discussions providing a lot more information and a lot more sort of critique and highlighting sort of uh, different parts of this. But this is, this, is, this is my take. So chapter two centers around this quote from Warren Buffett. I'll read it here. Uh, it's only once the tide goes out, uh, you can see who's swimming naked, right? Um, and so <laughs> it's a funny quote, uh, but what it means basically is that in times of high growth and great prosperity, uh, there's an awful lot of forgiveness, if you will, for those who are swimming naked, if you will. So those who are faking it, those who uh, are not up to snuff. Um, and we see this in a sense, it's really good. You can see this in China as a good example. You should see, like I've been to China uh, several times and there are entire like, communities in China where like nobody bought any of the houses like the houses just were built and just left there and there's nobody living in them uh, this is all this vacancy there and you'd be like wow wouldn't that destroy the economy well yes if that represented a significant portion of the of the economy but they were growing and growing and growing and growing so fast that all of these that we should call them sins if you will right all of these economic sins all of these business failures could be covered up by growth think about it this way if, uh, if you made an investment of all of your money right now, so what's all of your money? You're a student, right? What's all of your money right now? And the 5,000 bucks you may have in your pocket. Uh, maybe that's pushing it, right? Uh, and, uh, and you lost all of that. You say, wow, I lost all of my money. Uh, well, how long is it going to take you to grow that back? Well, a good summer's job, if you could get a summer's job or you know that kind of thing, and you could have it back. Um, and so what I'm trying to say there is that we can, when things are growing well, when we're sort of, when we're small and growing by a substantive percentage, our economic and business sins will be forgiven very quickly. But as we get bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, then if we stop growing and in fact start shrinking a little bit, then there's those, uh, the tide goes out, as Warren Buffett says, and we can see where these problems really are. And this is what we're seeing in the world now. Um, look at national debt. National debt in, uh, in Canada, in the US, uh, China, all around the world now, these national debts are massive. And it's no problem if your GDP is growing. You could kind of outgrow your debts and say, well, that's a really big debt. But if we grow our GDP by, you know, 4% or in, in, in the developed world, 10%, 15% in the developing world, those debts start to look smaller and smaller and smaller. So as a percentage of GDP, our debt is getting smaller. Okay, that's all good when things are growing. But what happens if we see a recession? Uh, what we're seeing right now is major contraction. So all of this debt, you can't outgrow this debt. Um, and essentially the tide has gone out. So now we're going to see who really can stand on their own. Um, look at it from a household perspective. As long as money is cheap and we can get more and more of it, well then we can take on debt to pay our debt, 
right? Um, people take on these credit card debts and they pay 29% or some uh, crazy thing like that in interest. And, um, yeah, okay, all right. Well, as long as I'm, I can actually borrow more money, right? And I can, and I, or I can sort of try to outgrow it and all of these kinds of things. But as soon as a recession comes and the banks say, okay, no more money, no more, we're not lending you any more money. In fact, we want to call some of your loans back in. It's quickly going to expose uh, this uh, systemic problem of far too much debt through. Uh, in, certainly in uh, the uh, in uh, households have far too much debt. Uh, many governments are highly leveraged, uh, and uh, businesses themselves are, are overly leveraged. So we'll see who's uh, swimming naked uh, when all of this, uh, when the when the, when our lockdowns uh, uh, pass and the government subsidies uh, stop flowing. Yeah, and so overall, oh, we see this idea of swimming naked, right? Um, recessions bring out problems such as income inequality and wealth inequality. We all understand income inequality, uh, the whole idea of the 1%, right? Uh, that 1% of the population controls this massive amount of, uh, of, of income. Uh, and uh, we see, um, uh, you know, we... That's that's something that's come sort of obvious to us. We look at CEO pay. Uh, your average uh, CEO makes 450 times that of an employee, right? And and this sort of income inequality is becoming much more apparent. And that's okay as long as my income is going up. But if I lose my job and my income's not going up, then I don't want that CEO making 400 times uh, what his uh, employees or her employees are making. Uh, wealth inequality is actually a he argues in the book a greater problem uh, than uh, even than income inequality. That wealth is beginning to be more and more and more and more and more concentrated uh, in the hands of very few people, and we're moving to a society uh, when that happens. That you know it's looking like some sort of you know these fiefdoms of you know of centuries ago, uh, and this is a real issue uh, in the world. And it's not just in the developed world; it's happening in the developing world too. We see incredible wealth concentrations in places like uh, China um, and in other parts of Asia. Uh, India. India has uh, uh, substantive wealth concentration. We look at the growth and the and the wealth in India, and yet we still see uh, substantive amounts of uh, of poverty. Uh, by those who don't have. The other thing he gets at in this chapter, which I think is really interesting, is how as humans we're actually changing. What is physically changing about us uh, and how that's going to affect us in terms of our productivity, our ability to continue to, to grow and to succeed. Uh, he looks at things like uh, how people are interacting with each other, you know, through cell phones and our bodies are actually changing because of cell phones, sort of hunched over, if you will. Uh, and this sort of absolute chronic problem of obesity that we're seeing, uh, you know, 40% of the people in Mexico, for instance, is just what he brings up in the book, uh, are obese, but we certainly see that in the United States. I see it here at home in Canada. Uh, and obesity is a major, major issue uh, for us as business people because it directly affects uh, productivity. Uh, people who uh, are on who people who are obese are unhealthy, and being unhealthy, uh, they're less productive uh, and have all kinds of medical issues. Uh, we're seeing it now uh, as we're facing this COVID nineteen crisis where um, people who are obese are so much more likely to either uh, have you know, much more complicated cases uh, of the virus or die of the virus. Um, and so that's important. And it's the food that we're eating. Uh, we're eating this terrible food uh, in our societies. And you know, that's, that's an issue that needs to be addressed. And we're not going to sort of outgrow that unless we stop and, and, and figure out what to do. And he brings that up uh, in the book. I mean, there's other interesting statistics here. Uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting because uh, he sort of ties this all in. I This one, this idea that 40% of people in Japan uh, are virgins uh, be, uh, between the ages of 18 and 35. Like something that's never, ever happened before. And I think what he's, the point there, this is as strange a statistic that is, uh, the point there 
is that it's talking about this social isolation uh, that we're beginning to see and what are the what are the effects uh, that that's going to have on our society and our ability uh, to grow uh, and to conduct ourselves uh, as a functioning society. And overall, people have had enough. People have had enough change. And this, this is the thing, right? This is this whole idea, where does Donald Trump come from? Where do these guys like Boris Johnson and Brexit and make America great again and all of that kind of stuff, where is it coming from? It's coming from enough, enough change. Um, we certainly see that, uh, you probably yourselves, you probably see that either. Maybe uh, maybe you, uh, you feel this way, uh, maybe, uh, uh, your friends or family members, uh, maybe older people in, that you know, have just had absolutely enough of this changing in our society. Uh, and they want it to stop. They want this sort of to go back again. And this is uh, certainly one of the sort of fundamentally uh, new uh, reactions against uh, globalization. It's certainly... Uh, globalization is being reacted against by a group of people who wouldn't have reacted negatively uh, against it years back. So people who voted in the United States, let's say, uh, people who voted uh, Republican or here conservative, uh, tended to be uh, very much sort of free trade people, right? Um, and saw their sort of prosperity lying in uh, taking uh, advantages in terms of economies of uh, of labor and those kinds of things throughout the world. And, and you know, we grew incredibly uh, here uh, because of that. And that's kind of slowed down. And all of this change that's going on and people started reacting to it. And so Donald Trump, um, as, as strange as it is to, to maybe uh, someone like myself, Donald Trump represents to these people a kind of stability, if you will, a, a, a nostalgia for a, for a, for a former world, a, a fix. Uh, and uh, there's this quote here uh, that he, he, he uses in the book, you'll read uh, from, uh, from Justin Trudeau, who is not necessarily as, as sensitive uh, to the average man as, uh, or the average person as, as perhaps he needs to be. But uh, he said in Davos, uh, uh, things have never changed as fast, but they will never be as slow. He's probably right. I mean, change is happening and it's happening rapidly. Um, and people don't want to hear that and people want to react against that. People want to stop that. Uh, and so that's a real issue uh, in society right now. So people are withdrawing, if you will, from this reality that we have, this changing reality. And they're sort of trying to find solace somewhere. Like why is a, re a reality television star the president of the United States? Um, it's because... Uh, people can sort of divorce themselves, if you will, of what's going on. And they can look at this and they can sort of, uh, this sort of alternative reality, uh, and they can take some solace in that. And, and that's sort of uh, where we are at the sort of beginning stage uh, as the tide is going out. Okay, so the other thing, I found this really, um, these really interesting clips on the internet, I found them. Uh, uh, with uh, Michael O'Sullivan. So I've sort of chunked out uh, the part of the interview where essentially he's asking, uh, answering the question, uh, why is the issue of the decline of globalization relevant to international business? So let's watch uh, how he answers this question before we go on to the next chapter. A very strong view is actually is that globalization uh, is coming to an end. Uh, and the funny thing about this is that lots of people talk about it, they talk about Boris, about Trump, uh, about all the dis disruption going on in the world, uh, but then they get back to their desks and they're still doing the same thing. So investment management in terms of its techniques, its outlook, uh, portfolio strategy and even thematics uh, haven't changed, uh, even though the world is beginning at a very tectonic level, beginning to change itself.